Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rock and Roll. My name is Tiger. I'm going to be your host for the next, eh, however long this takes. Uh, I'm still kind of getting the rhythm of the show down, so we'll figure out the proper podcast length sooner or later. So stick with me. This is only the second real episode. So this episode is once again being brought to you by my bid to make it to the New England Classic. Uh, The New England Classic is a fundraiser for the American Diabetes Association uh, as part of their Tour to Cure. And the 2019 uh, New England Classic is taking place in uh, July, I want to say. And it's going to be 550 miles, four states, one week of riding. And if I can raise $3,000, I get to go. If I raise $10,000, I'm taking T-Bone with me. That's my promise. But we'll talk more about diabetes and stuff after the show, so after the main meat of the show here. Okay. So at the beginning of the season this year, I had a couple ideas for shows that I wanted to do. And one of them was a show called Ask a Cyclist. And the idea of the show was that I was going to basically call information, get questions from psych- from from motorists about cyclists. You know, the questions that they all seem to have about why are you doing this? Why are you wearing that? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Um, and I scripted out a couple of these shows and then started figuring out, well, what do I need to shoot to make this to make this work? Right. And I realized that most of these shows were literally talking to the camera shows where it would be setting up a camera and talking to the camera. And um, unless you've got a really pretty face or you've got a really interesting face, those shows get really old really fast. So instead, instead of just scrapping them um, and instead of diving into just using B-roll footage of me riding a bicycle randomly, uh, I decided to adapt the scripts to a podcast type format, because this is something that at least this topic, this is something you can't just have a one sentence answer and then toss it. Uh, and this week we're going to be going with one of my, one of the ones that I did a lot of work on and it's why don't bicycles have license plates. Now I do have a script for this. I'm not going to be reading the script verbatim because this is a lot more casual than a show would be. So, uh, well, let's see here. Let's start from the beginning. This question actually came from a friend of a friend. Um, Over on Facebook, my friend responded to one of their friends who, um, as I recall it, was very loud, very long, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Colorful, colorfully, saying that bicycle riders need to have license plates so they can be held accountable because they can do anything they want to on the road and nobody's going to, okay. So being the only cyclist in the room, I chirped in and said, okay, would you, what what happened? You know, let me, let's get from information. And the general gist of what I got from this person was that the cyclist did something that they didn't like. So they wanted to have a way that they could get on the phone and call the cops and have the cops come and do something to the cyclist. I'm simplifying, but that's the general gist of what they wanted, but okay. Let's go on a good faith argument here. Let's say that there's that that the cyclist did something dangerous or or they they never actually said what happened. They just something offended them. So let's say there's a cyclist out there doing something dangerous. There's a cyclist out there who's being a menace or whatever. And the, the only solution that could possibly come up with is to have license plates on the bicycles so that you could call the cops on them. Okay, let's go on good faith. Let's say that this is the, this is truth. Okay. Assuming that, assuming that a license plate would be a horrible idea. And any politician that promised to make uh, license plates for bicycles a reality would be basically committing political suicide. So let's, uh, let's start from the beginning here. Why is this a bad idea? Well, let's talk about mounting these license plates. Just, just let's start there. Okay, so how would you mount a license plate onto a bicycle? Now, your first answer is probably going to say, oh, just put it on the seat, right? Well, that would be okay, except seats are not necessarily standardized. I currently own three bicycles. Uh, One of them is a cyclocross bike, one of them is a gravel slash road bike, and the other one is a pure touring bike. All three of them have different seats, uh, because all three of them have different purposes. And actually on the road bike, I changed seats out. I have one seat that's more my gravel winter and I have one that's more of a roadie summer. 
and each one of them have different specifications. They're different, different lengths, different widths. So it, it, it just wouldn't work. Then you also have uh, some seats. Uh, I'm going to kind of pick on one in particular, the Brooks saddle. Brooks is one of the oldest saddles on the market, and they make a leather saddle that the back of it has these little hanging hooks on it, which is great for bags because the bags are made that way. But you can't hang those same bags on, say, the saddle, the MTB saddle that's on my bike right now. Everything is standardized, but nothing works the same. And that's what, that's the problem with seats. The only possible way to do it is that most seats have a two rail system to attach it to the seat post. Um, and you might be able to standardize the width based on that. But I can also tell you from experience that every bicycle has different widths on those two rails that fit on the seat posts. They're the same width on the bike, but the moment they split off the bike because they have to do that in order to support the rider, then they go to different widths. So it's just not going to work. Let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, and then how do you attach it to the seat if you're going to do that? Well, you might say just zip tie it, right? Well, um, I can snap a zip tie with a, hard, with a nice hard tug. So, yeah, zip ties are not going to work. And, um, yeah, the, the, the rampant theft of bicycles and, and parts, if you have a free hanging license plate on the back of your seat, somebody's just going to walk up to it, rip the plate off of your bike and just walk away. And it's a crime of complete opportunity. And then you're screwed. Oh, um, yeah. And also I should mention this too. In Wisconsin, there's a law. That uh, if you're riding at night, you have to have a front-mounted headlight and you have to have at least a rear-mounted ref red reflector on the seat post or the seat. So by putting a license plate on the seat, you are now blocking that reflector. That, or you can, if you have a light, maybe that too. Um, a lot of people put a, um, a seat bag underneath that seat and that's where they hold their repair tools. So this is a bad idea. Okay, so where else could you possibly mount a, a license plate? Um, now, this is going to be kind of hard to describe, but some motorcycles have like a swing arm on the uh, on the rear wheel um, that kind of juts out from the bike, or from, yeah, from the motorcycle, X number of feet. Um, it's sort of like this outrigger kind of thing. The uh, problem with something doing like that is now you have a safety issue because now you have this big arm sticking out on the side of the bike, that, I mean, you know, people might be able to get through it, but how about drivers? Drivers don't give us any, any space at all to begin with. So now you've created something that the driver can hit and can possibly put a, put a rider on the side of the road. Not, it's not a good idea. Uh, where else would you mount it to? Um, how about a rear fender? A lot of people say, well, just put it on the fender like motorcycles do. Well, that'd be good if all bicycles had fenders. Um, all three of my bikes, I could mount fenders onto. There's a lot of bicycles. You can't, there's a lot of kids bikes that just don't have it. Uh, fenders in order to be effective, they have to be bolted onto the frame. And if there's no bolts, there's no screws, there's none of that on the frame. You can't put fenders on it. So therefore, ergo, you can't put a license plate on a fender that you can't mount on the frame. Okay. How about the frame itself? Uh, I don't even know where you'd put it on the frame, but well, number one, it defeats the whole premise of why you want to have a license plate to begin with, because if somebody does something awful to you and they're passing you, well, the license plate is in the back so that you can read it. It's not on the side so that you can't, you know, if you're going to catch up to that guy, now you're creating the hazard. Uh, let's see, where would you possibly put it in the frame? Maybe on the top tube. Um, which is that tube that sits, that's literally on the top of the bike, um, that connects like the handlebars to the seat. Uh, you, you might be able to put it there. Um, but then uh, you ruin an entire section of the bike, but, um, I, I can't even think how you would possibly do that. Cause every top tube has different widths on top of that. Now there's only one possibility that I could think of that would possibly kind of work. And that is on the seat post. And in order to understand this, you have to look at um, big tour events like the Tour de France, uh, Tour of Flanders, all those. There's and they, they, they make this uh, clip that clips onto the back of the seat post. 
and the number, the rider number, actually sits uh, in line with the slipstream of the bike so that it doesn't actually interfere. Again, though, this defeats the whole purpose of somebody rides past you, you read their license plate because now the license plate is north south and you are behind the driver. You have to get east west and you, you kind of get on going with this. You, it doesn't it doesn't work. Um, come to think of it, a lot of people will probably say something like, well, how about bike numbers? How about, how about, um, like what you see the, um, the, the enduro riders, the mountain bikers have, have, they have these, they have these big boards on the front of the, uh, on the front of the handlebars and for what they do, it's good. Uh, but there's a reason that you don't see road riders in road events wearing, having those kind of numbers, uh, because it's, it's a big sale for starters. And also, drop bars are different than mountain bike bars, and the cables and cords run way differently, and it's just, it doesn't work. It, it just, no. Let's see, you could also have people, you, you, you could have everybody wear, like, race numbers. You could force every rider to pin their numbers on whatever they're riding that particular day. And, okay, yeah, this would kind of work. Uh... Except that not everybody is going to want to drive a safety pin through their nice suit so that they can ride their bicycle to work that day. You got to think of these things. So, and also, I mean, there's you can damage clothing with this. It's just, no, it doesn't work. So, uh, yeah, there's no real place to mount them. It's, it's, it's kind of where we're going with that. How about the cost of entry? Um, and this is the this is the big part that would kill any kind of a license plate program is the startup cost. Now, let's just for the sake of argument, let's say that politicians who have no idea what they're doing decide that an underseat plate is the one that have to go with. OK, first of all, you have to safety test these plates. Any license plate has to be robust enough that has to be able to be left outdoors ad infinitum. So that means metal. Plastic is not going to cut it. Laminated pa paper is not going to cut it. You need metal. This is there's, there's a reason why everything that has to be outdoors is made of metal. You don't see many plastic stop signs. And uh, next time, I, next time you're not doing anything, take a look at your license plate. And if you dare, run your finger along the edge and feel it. And yeah, it's not knife edge sharp. At least it shouldn't be, but it's sharp enough. Now, when you're um, I wouldn't suggest actually doing this now, but there's some major veins that run between your legs right up against the crotch. Matter of fact, if you're overheating, they tell you to put ice packs on the insides of your thighs to cool your body down because that's how that, that's the big arteries, right? Or veins, sorry, veins, the big veins right there. So now you're going to put this sharpish piece of metal between somebody's legs right next to a major vein. Yeah. In a worst case scenario, like a crash, that plate, which is being held on probably by something like zip ties, yeah, that now becomes a projectile. And um, I, it, it, the Tour de France, uh, Tour de France will not run disc brakes on their bikes. They might have changed it this year, but for the longest time, they would not run disc brakes for the perceived risks of a disc brake cutting into a rider's leg in the event of a crash. Now, that's just a perceived threat. This is a license plate that you're going to have everybody put on their bike that's right between somebody's legs. The first crash is going to cause a lawsuit, and that's going to be a PR disaster for any state government. Okay, let's, let's say it gets rammed through somehow. How do you manufacture these plates? You're going to have to start from scratch. So you're going to have to create a full system to machine these plates. Uh, you might be able to recycle some machines, but you'll need to create the, um, let's see, how, how do they do it? The press ties or whatever, but you have to create the, the machines to create bicycle license plates. And this will kind of creep into the millions of dollars as far as production costs go. At least, and all people say, well, I work in that industry and it wouldn't, this is the government. Sorry, the government does that kind of thing. They spend way more way more money than they need to. We know this. And then there's the upkeep costs and stuff. And, and just for fun, just for fun, let's take the cost of yearly stickers. Because that would be the other thing they would do with these license plates. 
yeah, that they, they, they could probably get away with using the same car sticker. No, I think they couldn't because they had to be smaller. But okay, so they might be able to creep that in somewhere. Now, let's see. The cost of enacting this system. You need to file paperwork. The cost of starting a bike-specific registry in every state. Each person added to the equation. Yeah, it adds up. And also, um, how do you register for a bike, for, for a bike plate? Now, most bikes have a serial number on the bottom bracket, but a lot of them do not. And a lot of the older bicycles don't. So now you got a question. Do you have to get individual license plate for each bicycle? Or can you just have for a person and they transfer it from bike to bike? And then if they, if you do that, then if you loan your bike to a friend, then does your license cover theirs? Economically, this is just a really bad idea. Um, when do you start to see a profit from a program like this? Now, I'm not an economist, but I see this as being a 10, 20 year money sink. And that's assuming that everybody buys in, which actually creates another problem. And that is the bigger picture here. Because I want you to imagine you're a parent. Um, some of you, that's not hard, but I want you to imagine you're a parent and you want to do a nice family ride with your kids just around the neighborhood. So if you've got the nuclear family of two kids, two parents, that's four bikes. So you now need to purchase license plates for four bikes. Um, and if you've got kids, well, kids outgrow bikes pretty fast. So again, do you need to buy license plates for each individual bicycle or just for each kid? And if they outgrow the bike, do you, does the plate go with them? You know, what's the rules for that? And uh, let's see here, my car plates. I just renewed my car license sticker and that was damn near a hundred dollars. So multiply that by, I don't know, four people. Yeah, we're talking like $400 just so you can ride a bicycle. And uh, kind of like the mandatory helmet laws. Most people would say, nope, I'm outie. And that's it. Because rather than spend $400 to ride a bicycle, well, that $400 can go into gas for your car. It can go into food. It can go into, well, we could just walk there. More people would just not ride bikes and that would not be good. It would cause, well, there, there's a problem that with the mandatory helmet law idea. And that is that one person injuring themselves by not wearing a helmet is that offset by the thousands of people who are slowly dying, slowly killing themselves by just sitting on the couch rather than going out for a bike ride because they don't want to spend the extra money for the bike stuff. Same kind of thing applies here. Uh, does it really, is it really worth the couple of thousand dollars you're going to make to decrease the overall health of the population? <sighs> and also come to think of it, it would kill the big box mart bikes because there are so many people that go to your big box marts because they can't afford a nice bike, but they want to have a bicycle. So if you had to go to your big box mart and spend more money to buy the license plate than the bicycle, nobody's going to buy the bike. That's it. They're just going to, they're just going to stay at home. And the end result would be less cyclists. And a lot of drivers would be really happy about that. I don't, I don't doubt that at all, but as far as the population goes, it would be a really massive health hit. Not all of us can afford to go to uh, go to the gym. I'm not even joking when I say this. My local YMCA, they want a hundred dollars a month, plus plus I think it's like a two hundred dollar sign up fee. Oh yeah, and you had to sign a twelve month contract at the YMCA. Ridiculous. But if you go to your local big box mart, you can get a bike for. I mean, don't, don't, don't buy your bike from big box mart if you can help it. But if you gotta, if you gotta, you can buy a bike from a big box mart for like a hundred, 125 bucks. And as long as you maintain it, it'll last done. <laughs> there you go. You've got your, you've got your workout machine right there. But, um, there's one part of this that I didn't script for, but I think that this is the actual case of this entire thing. Let's go back to the beginning because 
the whole the whole point of this was that somebody was offended because a bicyclist did something they didn't like. Now I can speak from personal experience here that drivers do not like cyclists on quote their roads. Quote. Um, during the ride across Wisconsin, I was actually stopped. This guy in a four by four pulled in front of me and yelled at me for what cyclists ahead of me were doing. The, you know, why don't you guys stop at stop signs? And I'm like, dude, I'm stopped and I'm at a stop sign and you pulled up behind me and you cut me off. He then swore a bunch and then he, you know, he skidded the tires as he left. And the whole thing took less than 10 seconds. But the point is that drivers and cyclists, for some reason, drivers do not want cyclists on their roads. So here's what I think that a license plate would really be used for. Okay. I really think that if, if drivers had the ability to call the cops on a cyclist, they would do so for any infringement that they think the cyclist is doing. They're not in the curb. They're not close enough to the side of the road. They're, uh, they're signaling their turns. They're, they're waving their hands in a way I don't understand. So they must be flipping me off. Uh, they, they, they're going too fast. They're going too slow. They, they, they have lights. They're, they're too bright. They don't have lights at all. I'm going to call the cops on this guy and then have the cops harass the, the, the bikers. And this is, it happens. It, this is, this is what would, what, what the case would be. This is the other reason I don't think it's a good idea to give license to make, to make cyclists have license plates because it would be abused. As far as the cyclists are concerned, most of us, most of us just want to get from point A to point B. Uh, there's one section of road that um, connects one trail to another that I have to cross. It's about five miles, five, ten, five or six miles, maybe 10. I don't know. Um, but it's a long major highway and it's in rural Wisconsin, but there is no other way to get from one trail to the other trail. There's no side streets. There's no anything. So this is the only path I got. Mind you, it's in rural Wisconsin and people are generally cool. The further away from a city that you get, generally speaking, um, even when somebody's going like a buck 30, a buck 20 on you, they'll give you the entire lane because they know, Hey, that's a cyclist up there. And they're cool about that. I find the problem is in major cities, but that's generally cycling in a nutshell. But so no, I mean, I, I will admit that I am biased as a cyclist. I am biased that I don't think that having license plates on bicycles is a good idea, but we could probably go on for a very long time about why it's bad. The one thing though, the upshot of this is that, um, when I go out cycling, I see runners on the road as well, and they've got their iPhones strapped to their bicep and they've got their music cranking louder than mine because I can hear their music over mine usually. And they're just running oblivious to the world. Even when I'm yelling at them that I'm on their left, they don't even acknowledge the fact that there's anything outside their bubble. And yet drivers have no problem with this. I don't get it, but, uh, you know, maybe it's an image problem. I don't know. I think I've been rambling on long enough about this. So what do you think? Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment in the comments down below. If you're catching it on the webpage, oh yeah, the webpage, riverottercycling.club. Uh, you can actually hear the podcast first there. Um, and I think that those are open to, uh, to comments on the podcast page. Uh, no, they're not. Huh. I'll see if I can fix that. But... Leave a comment on the video. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, let me know. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm more than happy to hear it. And a lot of people say things like that, but I, I really want to know. I want to know where you're coming from. And uh, once again, let's make a plug here at the end of the show. So this show is being brought to you by uh, my bid to make it to the New England Classic. The New England Classic is a charity ride. Raises money to the American Diabetes Association. Um, and I need to raise $3,000 in order to ride this event. 
is taking place in the summer of 2019. So there's still plenty of time. But that said, the sooner we can do this, the better. Now, um, I am a type 2 diabetic myself, so we'll be doing diabetes shows. I think diabetes month is November, so I think that's when we'll do in those. And uh, this is a personal fight to me because I really don't want to have anybody have the same weekend that I did. So all the money that goes to the American Diabetes Association, it funds things like research, it funds education programs, it funds advocacy programs, things that, th things that help, things that will help stop diabetes. And this is the goal. This is what I want to do. So if you, if you like the show and you're like, hey, I'd like to help out, uh, you can go to uh, riverottercycling.club slash NEC for New England Challenge. A classic. I keep on calling it a challenge because I know it's 550 miles, four states, 20K of climbing. So to me, that's a challenge, but it's actually called the New England Classic. And I'll get it right one of these days. So go over there and you'll see a banner that, says, that has a Tour de Cure on it. And you can click on that and you can donate. Um, you can, uh, you can also go to, uh, what do I have the website set up? Well, it, 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 that's the easiest way to go there. I'll also have a link at the bottom of this podcast so that you can do that there. All right. I'm Audi. You guys have a good rest of the week. I will see you guys next week and maybe we'll do something a little, a little tamer next week. I think maybe, maybe next week it's, it's getting about to be about fall. You might want to go out for a nice little camping trip because you know, this is about when the colors start to turn. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Sound good? All right. You guys be safe out, and I'll see you out down the road. <laughs>